All right. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to the March 13th edition of the Cubevert SIG storage call. And uh, we'll jump right into the agenda. Alex, you have the first item, move clone off package into CDI AP, API library. Yep, so uh, uh, as you know, Kubert and other external projects in the future may want to vendor in uh, CDI API library. And that's all fine, but uh, today we also require that they uh, vendor in this regular CDI package. Uh, and that is because we have like this little leftover which is the clone authentic authentication bits. It's a bunch of helper functions that tell you if a specific service account can do a cross namespace clone and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a bunch of Hubert PRs to try to get rid of this, but like the real way to go, I think, is that we uh, we just make the change in CDI, move the leftovers to the API and make sure that any external project ever only needs the API library and nothing else. And uh, I just wanted to get some thoughts on this. Maybe there is a, re a good reason not to do this. I don't think there is, but there might be. And if we do decide to go there, then there's this uh, dependency update PR that we need before I can make the make the change all right thanks for raising it any comments uh any anybody think of a reason why this should not be done so it isn't the point of the cdi api to just contain the api and not any code i you know we're running the risk of maybe, you know, importing more stuff into CDI API and making that less portable. That's my only concern. So. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know what other libs that clone package brings in. Um, probably yeah. not anything that's not uh, already um, imported. Um, but yeah, no, so you say that Kubert is already making steps to try to fix this on their own? Did you say that? Yeah, they just copy pasted it. Uh, oh, okay. So uh, yeah. Right. yeah. I get what, what Alexander is saying. Um, we'd just be moving the problem to the CDI API lab library. Um, I think we already have some code there today. We have the is populated a uh, couple of helpers that tell you if a PVC is populated and stuff. But isn't this kind of like an uh, a separate thing? Like some some uh, projects may just need the CDI API, and if other projects actually want to implement the same like clone permission logic, that seems like a separate thing. So having them as, as separate imports. I guess I'm not sure why that's problematic just because it's to to uh, vendor or to import statements or what's the what's the problem with them being separate? Um, just the entry door for pulling in more stuff by accident. Oh, I see right there. Yeah. You mentioned that. Yeah. Should, shouldn't go modules only pull in the, the stuff it needs, not like the entirety of CDI? Yeah. Yeah, it only pulls like, yeah, you're right. If you're uh, going towards saying that there is no real problem today, yeah, you're right. It's just pulling in the clone package, and that's like, it doesn't bring any overhead at all. So it's just, uh, I think if you save, if you make a huge PR, save it, make depths update, and accidentally bring something new in that CDI brought in. And then somebody overlooks that, and you know the fun begins. That's the risk, I think. 
and why would that be mitigated if this uh, <clears throat> if this code was in the API library? Yeah, yeah, we'd just be moving the problem to the API library. Um, yeah, I think it's just, you know, uh, Kubert, you know, the Kubert, if you import, you know, Kubert containerized data importer, there's, you know, a lot of stuff in the go.mod that's going to get parsed. And that means, you know, it's going to build included in the dependency graph. Uh, you know, the Kubert API has a lot of go mod. Um, I'm presumably adding this to that. Um, uh, probably won't increase, increase it very much. So it's just dependency parsing. Um, it, you know, it may, I think, uh, I think the importing CDI, we have some um, things in our Godot mod that make it so that you have to like explicitly add a replace in your consumer Godot mod. I think that's probably some of the objection to it. It, it yeah, I don't know. Um, so I, I don't have- You can any... pare down the dependencies a bit by moving it into the API directory and maybe um, eliminate it from Kubert, but yeah, it's just about parsing the dependencies. I, I don't really have a, a huge problem with moving you know, that little piece of code into the API library. Uh, I just, think we should, you know, when we do it, we need to really think about why we're doing it and if it makes sense. And in this case, it probably makes sense. So. All right. Um, so I guess the next steps on this would be um, to further continue this, the discussion in the PR. Um, any other comments? from anyone on the line right now. All right, so let's move on. Alex, you have the next item as well, enabling clone from golden snapshot instead of PVC automatically on storage where it makes sense. Yeah, so uh, this is about, okay. So recently we introduced uh, cloning from a snapshot and the next step about this is to uh, have the data import cron feature capitalize on this. So uh, you would have like this snapshot source and uh, that would be your source for all VM disks and any new VM you make, new VM disk would be cloned from that snapshot. And for, um, where is that? Okay, Seth will, uh, obviously opt into this because with RBD layering, it makes total sense to uh, keep one snapshot and just clone from it. And a couple of questions I had about this is uh, firstly, the storage profile bit. So storage profile seems like the correct place to signal that cloning from a snapshot is Scale scales better on certain storage. And I was just struggling with where to put uh, this new configurable. Um, we already have spec clone strategy, but that is more about like the one-to-one -one clones that happen from PVC to PVC. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, my, my alternative suggestion is uh, uh, a new spec field, maybe something along the lines of golden source type, something like that. And uh, the golden source type is snapshot and you know that uh, it scales better just keeping a snapshot as one source for future clones instead mm -hmm. of a PVC. And it could be like a, an, an existing uh, kind from the Kubernetes API or something. So that's mm -hmm. nice. Um, 
Okay, just a couple quick questions. Do we have any links that we can put into the agenda to any uh, existing PRs or anything just to provide context for those who may not have followed this feature uh, closely yet? Yeah, yeah, I'll put so those in. If you could add that just uh, as a kind of, just to help people um, contribute. The second thing is, yeah, this sounds like a, you know, a classic naming is hard uh, issue. And I just wonder, do we use the term golden anywhere else in the code? I'm not sure that that's a... Uh, yeah, no, we it's don't. Kind of, it's we kind don't. of a casual term. I think what this is actually asking or setting is, um, it's really specific to the data import cron controller. So it might be, you know, it's basically how should the data import cron controller create um, or store what's the format that it's storing the imported images? Okay. Um, so just like being really specific about what it is um, instead of, you know, kind of, um, I don't know, that would just be my suggestion is to just try to find something like that. It's yeah, clone strategy is a, is a, yeah, we can't like override that or use that in, in any way. Cause that's like, that's really like one-to-one -one cloning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a good suggestion. That's, uh, it really only applies to the data import prone controller. Okay. And I think we'll uh, want, just one other comment is I think we'll want to open this up for um, anybody who who happens to know that a, another particular storage provisioner would prefer this strategy as well. Um, it can definitely be added to you know the other storage profiles. Yep, definitely. I was uh, thinking to have like this uh, knowledge. Uh, storage knowledge map similarly to how we keep uh, access modes for provisioners mm -hmm. so something similar to that and then I, it would only contain uh, the rbd string at first but later on it would also have other ones as we discover more storage where this type of cloning makes more sense Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I still have to put the links there, with the original feature, but I did want to raise the data import cron changes that need to happen. Um, it's mainly about scratching off an option. I had this thought that we might want a data volume API that says, give me a snapshot instead of a PVC, but then it seems kind of clunky, like uh, we already kind of committed to map data volumes to PVCs very early on. And I, I think it's good that we did that. And maybe having this kind of data volume API that says, hey, uh, I want a snapshot in the end. So give me, a, don't give me a PVC. That's kind of uh, clunky, but I did want to raise it. So should we be managing the volume snapshot ourselves in the data import cron or is this kind of data volume api making sense to someone so or I, any other i i thought we were going to basically mark the data volume if we're doing like a, a snapshot clone to leave the snapshot and then from there we can make you know, new clones from the same snapshot. So in, instead of saying, I want the end result to be a data or a uh, snapshot, just, you know, the end result will be a PVC, but I'm leaving the intermediate snapshot for reuse later. I thought that's what we were doing. So. Uh, yeah, that was the original idea, but we later scratched it off and we went with uh, just snapshot sources. So somebody is creating their snapshots alone manually or not manually and those are served as a source so 
there's no uh, smart clone happening, you know, like uh, CDI doesn't create this type of uh, volume snapshot. All right. So essentially for making snapshots, we're not involving CDI, which also makes sense. Just use the Kubernetes API. Yep. Yep. I think, I think it's important to kind of remember um, sort of the evolution of how we're treating data volumes these days, especially in light of the garbage collection and some of the other things that we've done. So data volumes, we're really emphasizing that they're used for provisioning uh, the contents of a PVC and that they're kind of useless after that. And that afterwards, once the PVC is prepared, we should be using the PVC directly. So in light of that, or in view of that uh, design decision, it doesn't make sense to me to have a DV API that says that we want something that's already been imported to be stored in a certain way, um, because that's the consumption side. And so therefore, at the consumption side, we want to use um, resources, Kubernetes resources directly. So I think it's more correct for if data import cron decides that it wants to maintain some snapshots instead of uh, PVCs that it should be doing that on its own. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I think that is all for me. I'll just add some links to better capture the discussion here. And I think I'm, yeah, I'm done with my topics. Okay, great. Thanks for raising both of those. Um, so the third major bullet point we have is to triage CDI issues. And so I can jump into that. And okay, so we are on this issue about adding an expected hash to data volume. So um, I believe this is about, yeah, having, making sure that the import was successful by comparing a, a hash here. Um, I think my biggest concern about this feature is that uh, we do some manipulation of the image after it's been imported. Um, and therefore, at what phase, I mean, I guess if we if we have a stage where we're downloading the exact uh, content, checking the hash before we start to manipulate it, it could be possible. But since we're doing some like streaming inline conversions, I'm not sure if that's very practical. Yeah, we'd essentially have to always do the download to scratch. Um step and then verify after that mm -hmm. and i mean i think we could potentially like in the presence of the hash field that it changes the way that it imports but um i do wonder like how critical is it to have something like this it seems like a nice reasonable feature otherwise well i think i mean http import is totally insecure without a hash um, HTTPS, uh, at least, you know, there's no, you know, no man in the middle, um, but you may still want to uh, just, uh, validate that it's what you expect it to be, you know, no one changed it on the ser other server side or something. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah, so we've been running with this for a long time. I'm just going down to see the latest. Oh, cool. Um, Eric Blake has a comment here. Merkle hash. Interesting. Okay, so this is a libguestfs um, posting. Okay, so this is interesting. We've got some updates to consider here after a while. Um, So I don't want to take I don't want to take us down the um, the rabbit hole to look at this quite now, uh, but I guess it'd be interesting if there was somebody who would want to take a look at that and see if it could be applicable. 
and then we can decide maybe if we wanted to further propose uh, that addition. Um, so I guess I'm not sure. That's pretty much what this one would need if we wanted to um, enhance it further. I'd need somebody to probably follow that suggestion. Um, okay. Any other comments on this one before I try to go back to the main list? All right. So let's see. Did we start, I'm trying to think, did we start? Um, I'm gonna find it. Are these ordered by anything? And I guess this is the default order. So I'm just kind of trying to go up and find. All right, so here's this. Are we going upwards, right guys? We didn't talk about the extended yeah. metrics yeah. for importer yeah. pod yet. Okay. Okay, let me, oops, I'm having a hard time with the, overlay from there we go okay expand extend metrics for importer pod let's see what are we looking for i'm calling the metrics endpoint of the importer we only have a percentage of transferred data would be better to have raw values okay so some interesting additional data um just know that whoever opened the issue, their account is no longer there. That's why it's a ghost. Oh, okay. Yep. But I think this is related to the um, VDDK import. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess the percentages there are uh, not really useful. If you run into a large block of zeros, it'll skip a bunch of stuff. And sure. normally the percentage will jump. And then the estimation is, is incorrect. So, Isn't that a pretty general problem, though? Like, yeah. when, whenever you're doing, like, I've never seen a completely smooth progress bar unless it was, uh, unless it's fake. So, um, but I, I think in the end, we, we, if we have the raw data, which we don't always have, we can put it uh, as a value on the endpoint. It's not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like Alvaro took a look into this a little bit. Um, yeah. Can I think um, this this is a, a you know relatively easy thing to add, um, at least for the values that we have. So, is the structure of the return data um, such that we could add a field there? Without it's, a, it's a Prometheus making... endpoint, so you would just put a um, counter or whatever in there. Okay, and do we ha and we have the transfer rate for certain uh, types of transfers available? We have a if we're um, so the the thing is if we're using the QME image to do the the streaming conversion. We don't, but we do have the rate for if we're like saving it to uh, a scratch space. You know, we use the Go uh, readers, and we mm -hmm. have a reader in there that basically counts the amount of bytes that happen or that you know, have been transferred. So from that, we can calculate speeds and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. I also wonder how this yeah. factors. <laughs> Yeah, it's just the thing with that. That's just that's just part of the operation too. Yeah. Then, then right. we don't factor in transferring from scratch to the target. Yep, the convert phase can be sometimes yep. even longer. Right, and I, I think that's one of the main reasons we really haven't done anything too much with this because there's multiple steps that have, each have their own transfer rates. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm just going to add a little comment here. Uh, uh,
Okay. Um, so yeah, I don't know what we want to do there. Like we've we've had some uh, discussions in the past about surfacing um, additional phase information on the data volume for these multi-phased operations. So you could get an idea about that. Um, it hasn't really gone anywhere because it can be kind of used to really use that information effectively. You got to understand the internals about how the imports actually happening. Um, so I'm not sure about it. Um, I feel like we could, I mean, it feels kind of like a won't fix to me um, or that there's not a ton of demand for this at the moment anymore. So. Uh, I don't know what we want if we want to try to close it or um, if there's anybody that's interested in picking it up. Other just general things to note, you know, we're starting to uh, um, implement populators and with populators, there's no, um, well, it's just a hard problem to report any sort of uh, incremental progress. Like where does that happen? Mm -hmm. um, so, um yeah <laughs> yeah that's an that's a good thing to um also worth noting is that with our planned move to uh I'm gonna, there would no longer be a natural place to report any metrics. So investing mm -hmm. in this may not Okay. All right. Um, yeah, I mean, I think for me, this is feeling like one that we should close. And if somebody really loves it, uh, we could, they could reopen. Uh, so I'm going to just, uh, if there's any dis disagreement, let me know uh, of the previous comments. Uh, we would like to close this issue if there is uh, ah, sorry trying to type as fast as I can interact please reopen Okay. The goal is to kind of clean these up. So successful there. Um, all right. So let's come back and see if we can take a, another one here. Resize volume after clone. I think we okay. we already talked about this one uh, maybe a long time ago. Yeah. Here that comment is. Not long ago. Yeah. And we think it can be closed. I'm going to say uh, closing per the previous comment. All right. Close this one out and let's go to the next one. Resizing the PVC of OS volume does not reflect in the VM. Okay, this one's not something we can probably really get too involved in, but I'm guessing I'll, I'll read this here. Uh, added the PVC spec, the increased size of the volume, but if I log into the VM, I see the volume is, yeah, that's because you need to. So I, I know that. Um, see Maya doesn't appear here anymore but she did work on a feature where so there's a piece where we're actually signaling to um to QMU to rescan the volume size when it's changed so the OS 
uh, we have like from that perspective, um, the, the model of the device is updated. Uh, the virtual machine operating system itself still needs to rescan and discover. But the problem is, is this is uh, OS specific, how you would do this. And then also within the OS, it depends on how you're using your disk, uh, whether you have LVM or classic partitioning. So it's not something that can really be done automatically. Um, this, it looks like they're just asking for LS block or F disk to show the new size. Um, I wonder if that's actually fixed then based on, so Maya's saying here, you enable a few, oh, feature gate. Okay. That's from February of last year, a year ago. Do we know if this is open? Okay. I see this Alvaro. Um, Okay. So Alvaro, you said you think this can be closed? Yeah, I think so. The feature, as long as the feature gates turned on, I think it's resolved then. Um, yeah, because I think when we first introduced this, we didn't have the feature gate on, but it's now been turned on. Okay. All right, excellent. Well, let's see if we can take tackle another one or two here. Um, no information if storage class can't be detected. Okay, um, added by accident storage class called blank. And then we can't retrieve the storage class. The data volume status remained empty. Okay. I'm surprised that, that a blank storage class is even permitted with no name. Okay. Yep, I agree. It's a good first issue. Um, Okay, so I think this is probably something that, um, while it's been flagged as a good first issue, it should be pretty easy to fix. Um, so anything... I have a, a, a question. Isn't the refactoring we're doing uh, sort of fixing this? Because um, regardless of an error in the um, stage where we're you know trying to do updates at the end we should update the status of the data volume and if there's an error in the previous stage that should be reported at that point if i understand what we're doing correctly um i, I think um michael and uh, arnon should know better but um it, it might sort of solve itself just because we're we should be reporting uh errors better because you know what happens right now is in the reconcile loop we get the error because the storage class cannot be found and we error out and there's you know there's no update of the status at the end and I think the way we've uh, split it out into the you know the sync and the the uh, status update phase the status update phase always happens. So. Okay. Um... Michael or Arnon, anything? Yeah, uh, I have no idea what it would do. I mean, yeah, it would be interesting to see uh, what exactly happens now. Uh, is there a p? Is there a PR that that merged, or one that we're waiting on to merge before we could recheck that? Because I think that that's something we could capture here as a comment. Uh, Arnon would know better, but I please mention me in this uh, code. And I'll check it uh, right after the meeting. Uh. 
Okay. All right. So I guess that's the follow up action for this one. I'll close it and we can move on. Um, next is HTTP import Ubuntu server image to data volume is extremely slow. Using CDI to import from a disk image hosted on an HTTP endpoint is slow. They want it to be fast, of course. Um, okay, so let's see what the latest on this is. Okay, so we've got some comment from Richard about multi-connection support. Um, in some special cases, the importer does not go through the NBD kit curl plugin, but instead downloads the file to scratch space. Okay. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh... It in certain cases it is faster to um, just download the file to scratch space and then write it to the target than do the direct uh, write to the target. Yeah, like significantly faster. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I think Richard spent some time uh, investigating it, um, and he's I think you know I, I think he's tried he he well he's the comments there but uh, I think. Yeah. Um, you know, ideally we would like, you know, you know, everything's a trade-off between space and 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 performance. But you know, it, it was really certain cases multiple orders of magnitude slower to do the direct conversion. Mm -hmm. So um, we either need to find a way to do the direct conversion faster or default to scratch space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think this topic has come up a couple of times in the past where there's enough corner cases where we're having issues with um, NBD kit or, you know, the direct convert and, you know, a couple of these cases where it's starting to feel like the sim just doing the simple thing, which is to always download and then convert um, with, you know, the file after we've already received it might make more sense. Um, but yeah, we haven't really acted on on that those comments yet. So I'm not really sure what the best uh, bet is here. Um, I kind of wonder if when we adopt populators, if we ought to just simplify the logic at the same time. Well, if this this plugin is available uh, at this point, it, it should be relatively easy to just add it to the the list of plugins we're using. Uh, Richard uh, created a, the retry plugin not too long ago, and we're already using that. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, I think we just do have to like, um, yeah, we should see how much it helps. Uh, uh, you know, because I think, um, yeah, I think we want performance to be relatively in line, and also. Um, being relatively uh, deterministic about what we do and it, it's just more understandable um, and yeah, having fewer different code paths is good too. So I think we just have to understand the trade-offs, but yeah, we should definitely see what he's got, his latest work is and how it changes things. Okay, so that's kind of what we talked about. Um, I'm not sure, you know, if we have somebody that wants to take a look at that or not, but it's here for you if you do. Um, let's go on to the next one. Feature request support retained 
PV as source. Um, didn't we basically solve this recently with uh, static volume annotation? Poss I mean, it's possible that Michael's new um, annotation would do that, actually. Let's double check. Well, uh, I think, uh, well, so the annotation that we added will only work if the P, I think what this is saying is, you know, we could create, uh, when we create the PVC, we would set the, vo the volume name. We don't do that um, now, but we look for, basically, I think this could work under certain circumstances. If the PV has the claim ref set to the name, to the appropriate name, it would work. Mm -hmm. Um. Michael, would you be willing to just comment to that effect in here? Sure. Um, yeah. With a little more precise. Uh, yeah, just tag, tag me and I'll I'll update it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, let's try to tackle one more, I think, and we've made some pretty good progress today. So um, that's good. So let's do support read write once pod for data volumes. Okay, it's coming from David Vossel. There's a new PVC access mode. Um, okay. So he's suggesting a possible fix here, I guess. And uh, it's up to us to decide, I guess, what we want to do. Um, no further comments since that initial report. Oh, we have from Alex last year. Um, yeah, um, it it's. I don't think it's as straightforward. I think me and Michael discussed it briefly. And uh, the first thing we thought about was the expansion pod. Uh, yeah. That might run into issues, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe I, we. Uh, I think this is still alpha. Okay. It was alpha when I wrote my comment, so. Uh, yeah. That would be weird. Also, it's not going to work with probably the hot plug pod, like the attacher pod. Um. And also read write once just generally isn't something that uh, for cubevert purposes that we we recommend anyway because it's uh, not enabling live migration. So I'm just not um, not sure why we would necessarily like why it's super high priority to support this. Yeah, I, I wonder. Yeah, exactly. I wonder what's the backing. Uh... Motivation for David that mm -hmm. opened the issue. It might be because I'm wondering if for, well, no, I guess for, um, yeah, I'm not sure um, what that would be. So I guess we should see if it's, um, Okay. All right. Um, so I think for this one, that's kind of the next thing we need to see. And um, I, I find that, yeah, there's probably not a ton of motivation on that other than like the fact that the Kubernetes API allows it. So we should as well, but um, it doesn't seem like it's incredibly useful. And yeah, we'll need to think about how that would affect other kubevert features as well, if we're taking the kubevert centric mindset here, which we should be. Okay.
All right. I'm going to say that I think we've probably tackled enough issues for today. That was actually pretty good. Um, got through quite a few. Um, any other topics at the end here before we close out for the week? All right. Sounds like not. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining. And we'll catch you at the next one in two weeks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.